So the first thing that we needed to do, and we have done now, is we've made a file cache out of this. This is, is super important because I don't want to have to keep recreating these voxels every single time that we want to do something to them. And you know, to get it to play through to 64 frames takes about 20 minutes at this point because it's fairly high detail. So we've just made a file cache as we've done before. I've left all of this. In fact, what I'm going to do is take that backdrop there, grab it, not that, thank you. Grab the backdrop. And this, if we do need to recreate or need to make any changes later, this is still here for us to do that. We'll just move that out of the way. But we're going to be working with our cache. And as you can see, caches are super important. We talked about this a bit last week. As you can see, I'm putting in three properties here, voxel fog density, voxel temperature, and voxel velocity. Those are the three properties I'm going to need to make a flipbook in Unreal. And also if I if I go out through the other method, which is the, the open VDB plugin, I've already got the VDBs cached here. As you can see, it's an open VDB file. So now we're going to do some cool things with particles. So because we're going to use the voxel velocity to add vector particles with, I've just grabbed a frame, frame 34, and I've got myself a volume scope here and I've hooked it up to a terminal. So all I really need to do is make, in my volume scope, I need to make sure that I've got display flow lines on and cull by property fog density. So this will just put the diagnostic onto the volume, but not where there's not enough density. And we'll just plug that in and see what that looks like. So there you can see the paths of the particle velocity. So this is showing us the voxel velocity using flow lines to do it which is absolutely correct. And that's what we need to use to drive some particles with the volume. Let's go back and grab our platonic shape here that we used to generate this. And we'll just put in a pass node. So we've got that along and this can, this is gonna become our particle source. So let's uh, just call this source shape. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna scatter some points on this. So let's, let's throw down a point scatter. Before I scatter it, I'm going to convert it to a volume and I'm going to convert it to a fog volume. So, mesh to volume. There we go. It doesn't have to be terribly high res. We'll pop that in there. Mesh comes out. And just for now, let's hide this and break that connection and pop these points into a point scope. Like that. And just drop them out to the diagnostic as well. You can see there, there are my points scattered inside the volume. Let's quickly turn that into color and we'll just make this a much nicer one. We don't need this many points, I don't think. I think probably a better idea would be to do 100. You've just got points in a volume of space there, which is, which is great. So now we're going to need to use the compound that was supp that's supplied with the video. Advec points. So in here, this is going to create an advec particles for us. Let's plug our points into initial points. We'll plug our cache, which is here, a file cache that can go into the area volume. And then we'll need a time node to put into the frame. Like that, and we'll leave the step size as, as default. Let's output this to the diagnostic and see what we get. You can see there are particles there, very faintly, but they are there. Come out here, you can see it. Let's let's run those particles through a point scope. In fact, let's just run it through this one. So we'll plug those into there, and the red red ones will, will just get red particles there. And to make sure that that's working nicely, we'll just turn this size down a little bit. There we go. So you can see here if I Let's turn my volume back on. And you can see that the volume is affecting the points. So the points are moving along with the volume. So how does that work? Well, let's go through the effect points node. The effect points node is an iterate. You can tell because it has a port feedback loop here. So what comes in is we get points, the points come in the initial points come in, 
And these points come in and an array is built. If I just disconnect that, and try that again. Yep, that's still doing it. Which is then merged. And this is basically saying that if my start frame is equal, well, if my frame is equal to one, then use the initial points here. If not, build an array out of the new points, merge the geometry and use those. Then we have a voxel field coming in and this is our, our area volume is building this voxel field multiplied by the step size. And we're displacing our points with the voxel field. It's, it's pretty simple. If I was to take my step size down to say 0 0.02, play that back. And if I just go to wireframe mode, you'll be able to see that my particles, the big red dots, aren't following the volume quite as well because they're not quite getting, there's not enough uh, of a step size for them to follow. So if we just go back to 0 0.05, Back and replay that. So it just needs a little fiddling, fiddling about. Get it to match the volume a little as close as you like or not. I'm quite happy with that. That's pretty good. I think. And of course, there's a good explanation in the PowerPoint as well. It tells you all about how this works, like we've just been through it. Now let's color those points so they're looking a little bit better. So what I've done here is I've just sampled the volume, vo the volume's voxel velocity at the points, our output at vectored points positions, normalized that, and turned it into a color. Well, applied it to the to the points as a color, and this is what you get. So you can see it's mostly green as the points are always going up, but as they start to curl around at the edges, you can see the different colors come in. That's one way to do it. We can do the loop three example from the PowerPoint. And let's do that example because that's, that's a good way to see it. So what we need to do is we need it to loop between two colors based on a fraction of something. Okay. I'm still, I'm just going to take the length of these guys. So that's the magnitude of the vector. And because we don't know what that length is, we could just plug it in to our diagnostic color. It'll mostly go white because those, those lengths are going to be quite high. So it's from zero to 25. So I'm going to get the, the bounds of that array. Yep, we're doing this thing again. And let's just break that connection so we don't end up hurting ourselves. And we're going to do a change range. So normal. As we do, min and max go in there, the value itself goes in there, and we want to change that range from whatever it is to minus one and one. Okay. So now we need to pick some colors and loop between two sets of colors to get the result. So we need to do a little bit of logic first. So what I will do here is if I will go this is less or equal than say minus 0.33, so minus a third. Then we're going to do one thing. All right. Of course, we're going to do a greater or equal as well to one third. Why am I using thirds? Because we want to do three things. And we're going to do something there as well. So let's make some color values. We'll change that across to a vector, as we always do. And we're going to go for red. And we're going to go for yellow. And let's go for magenta. Let's not go red, let's go for cyan. So what we want this to do is, depending on what the value is, we need to loop between two colors. And of course, if we're using a loop, put a loop in. And that's the first one. And that's the second one. And that's a loop. We'll put another loop in. And 
that's the second one and that's the first one. Basically what we're doing is, if this is true, so if the point is less than or equal to 0 0.3323, here. We'll work on what's, what we're actually looping with in just a second. If it's false, right, if it's false, we're going to be wanting to use this guy. In fact, we should be able to do it between, so if it's less than or equal to zero, that's the loop it uses. If it's greater than zero, that's the loop it uses. So what are we going to use to loop? So what, what's our actual fraction here? Okay, that, that's the next thing that we're going to need to work out. And what we've got here is we've got voxel velocities, which have been remapped to this. So what I'm going to do is use a node here called split fact fraction. And what this does is it takes whatever the output is and it gives you both the integer and the fraction. Now this, actually I won't use that because it's, it's not important. I'm going to put in another if, and I'm going to use the absolute value of this, because this is always going to be, this is always going to be between minus one and one. So the absolute value will be between zero and one, it'll just take the negative. So that means that for my lower ones, I can use the values themselves as a loop. And for my higher ones, I can use the absolute value of my, points as a loop. And we'll take all of this and drop it out to our diagnostic material and see what color our points go. So there you go. Let's play that through. So you can see the length of the velocities make a big difference here. These guys aren't moving at all because they're just going from the, because our volume lifts off the start point, they're, they're stretching their way up from the start point. So the faster they move, the closer they're going to get to a yellowy color, reddish, pinkish, a pinkish yellowy color. And that's just a result of these two loops. You can also do this in the loop as Ying Ying did in the PowerPoint. But basically what we're doing here, just to quickly recap before we move on, is we're taking our cache and we're taking one of the attributes that we've saved on our cache and we're using it to do things. That That's pretty much the, the basis of it. That's pretty much the beginning and end of it. So we have our points, they're being invected with our, with our compound that we brought in, then they're being displayed, and then they're being colored based on the velocity. Obviously this is a quick and dirty example and you guys can absolutely make things a lot more beautiful than this. But what the gist of it is, is that the faster the particles go, the pinker they get, with yellow in the middle. So if I was to put in a lot more particles, or a lot more points to generate particles, so 2,500 points, let's see what that does for us. Then you're really starting to get an idea of the volume. You can see all of the volume motion in there, it's working really well. You can see the colors based on the speed. We're kind of making a tree because, <laughs> because this system isn't designed to work with, with a volume that stops emitting at the center. But you get the idea. To fix that, I think I could pretty much just take my cache here and scatter in the cache. There you go. So it's now no, I don't think it's any longer drawing that big old tree up. It is a little bit. But they're still being evicted, you can still see what happens. And then you could cull them if they didn't move from frame to frame. But yeah, that's something very cool you can do with particles. Uh, you could then render these in Arnold as, as an addition to your volume if you were going to do rendering and things like that. We are going to do rendering the, the next part of the lesson. 
but uh, I'm not going to put particles in there as well because you know you guys will be sitting there for ages. But just be aware that there is no, absolutely no reason why you couldn't make these very very small particles, for example. So just change them to point particles like that. Set up the right kind of colors. Base you could base the color on the temperature too, for example. Just the same way the render engine does and you can then get a grainy particle render by rendering this as well as rendering the, the fluid itself that we're going to use for our flipbook which is what we're going to go on to next <laughs>